The scary stories will begin in 30 seconds. Before they do, I just want to remind you that in this video, and in all my videos, I have minimal ads, so that your experience is better without constant interruptions. If you want to show your support, I want to ask that you subscribe and hit the thumbs up. It really helps my channel so much. Now, let's begin. Back when I was a law student at a prominent London university, I moved into a shared house in Peckham during the final year of my studies. Half the reason I was so keen on that particular house was that only one of the other apartments was occupied. The trouble with being in a student house is that they tend to be pretty rowdy places. You never quite know when someone is going to bring home a bunch of friends from a club night and spend the wee small hours blasting music in the kitchen or whatever. Obviously, that's not conducive for a good sleeping pattern. So with the help of some close friends, I moved all of my stuff into the flat one morning, with every intention of going upstairs to greet the person that lived on the top floor and the only other person living in the house. But at one point, as I moved some bags up the stairs, I looked up the stairwell and saw someone looking down at me with a cold, dull expression on their face. It was a guy, a rather tall one too, with short, cropped blonde hair and very, very pale blue eyes. I mean, they were so pale, it was like they shined out of his eye sockets at me. This rather alarming shade of icy blue. I said hi to him in as friendly a way as I could muster. But instead of returning my greeting, he just stared at me for a few minutes before slowly backing away from the stairwell. Then I just heard a door slam as he disappeared back into his apartment. The person I was with just kind of gave me an awkward, amused look as we whispered our hopes that he wouldn't end up being a weirdo or anything like that. When I look back on it, it was such a hauntingly prophetic moment. If only we knew how right we were. The first few nights were nothing unusual, and I was actually relieved that I would get the peace and quiet that I had been hoping for. That was until one evening, when I was sitting in my computer chair and doing some research on international trade law, and I heard something coming from the hallway outside. At first it didn't bother me too much, and I simply put on some ambient music that always seemed to help me concentrate, and tried to ignore the sounds coming from outside. But as the night went on, they seemed to get louder and louder, and eventually, I couldn't contain my curiosity, walking over to the door so I could get an idea of what exactly they were. It was the sound of screaming, in particular, a woman screaming, and it was coming from the apartment upstairs. At first, I thought the guy up there was just watching a horror movie or something, and that's what the screaming sound was. But the longer I listened, the more I realized that whoever was up there was listening to that, and only that. Like to the point I could hear the audio file, or whatever, looping at a certain time. He was just up there, listening to the sound of a woman screaming in pain for like an hour straight. I know that I should have gone up there and asked him to turn it down, but the idea that he was just sitting in his apartment listening to the sound of a woman screeching for that length of time, it really scared me. It was hours before it was silent again. I'm talking like one in the morning before I could finally even think about getting to sleep. Questions were rolling around in my mind as I was lying there in the dark. Like what kind of person just listens to stuff like that for hours at a time? Or worse, what if he was watching something criminally violent? I lay awake for hours, absolutely terrified of my new situation. One I couldn't just escape from so easily, since I had spent a huge amount of money on the admin charges, first month's rent, that sort of thing. I was so bloody worried, and it was with those thoughts echoing through my mind, that I finally drifted off to sleep. I was absolutely exhausted during lectures the next day to the point where my mates were asking me if everything was okay, 
since apparently I didn't look good. I told him I was okay, but that something was seriously weird about the guy who lived upstairs. A few of them consoled me with tales of their own weirdo housemates, and that as creepy as he seemed to be, at least he wasn't a perv who was constantly trying to get into my pants or whatever. And I suppose that, in a manner of speaking, they were right. But that night, I just found myself getting pretty angry that this guy was so bloody inconsiderate and marched up to his apartment with every intention of getting him to turn the volume down. So I rock up to his door, knocking on it loudly as I wait for him to answer. Little side note, I have dealt with noisy neighbors before. Usually, the moment you knock, the noise turns down. They are embarrassed, apologetic, generally reasonable people. Only with this guy, the noises did not turn down at all. I can't even describe how unnerving it was to hear what was coming from inside that apartment. I still don't know what those screaming sounds were from, be it from a movie or a weird noise core album or something else, but I'm telling you now, they sounded real. They were utterly blood-curdling, the kind of screams you only get out of someone when they know they are about to die. I was positively shaking with fear by the time I heard the door begin to unlock. And when it opened, what I saw was more unnerving than I could have possibly imagined. The weird blonde guy I had seen looking down the stairwell at me just a week or so before was wearing a mask. One that I find very hard to describe when I think about it. It was made of varnished wood, I know that, and it looked kind of like a death mask, like the cast of a person's face that's made when they've recently passed away. Only, there was something horribly, horribly wrong with this mask, something that I found deeply unnerving. It was misshapen, warped, with indistinguishable words or symbols carved into it, but that's not what really freaked me out, because when he opened the door, he was also completely and utterly stark naked. I remember backing up on the spot, putting a bit of distance between myself and the masked man, before I asked him, in the politest way possible, if he would be so kind as to turn the music down just a little bit. He didn't move. He didn't speak. He just stood there staring back at me from the eye slits that had been cut into the mask. I just kept backing up, shifting my tone for polite request to outright apologetic that I had been so rude as to disturb him. But still, he didn't move. He didn't make a sound. He just carried on staring at me. By the time I saw the scars that ran up and down his chest... I just ran back downstairs into my apartment and locked the door behind me, almost hyperventilating with fright as I called a friend who lived nearby and asked if I could stay at their place for a while. They were curious as to why I was so upset, and especially as to why I suddenly didn't want to stay at the flat that I had previously been so made up with. But once I explained, they invited me to come over immediately and told me to stay as long as I wanted. From there, I contacted the police and made an indecent exposure complaint, but the officer I spoke to said that without any witnesses, it would essentially be my word against theirs and there was nothing to build a case on. They recommended that as inconvenient and disappointing as it was, that it was best that I just stay away from this disturbed, masked neighbor as much as possible. I ended up moving out of the flat as quickly as I could, going back with a few friends during the daytime to collect my things. And once again, the guy upstairs watching from the stairwell, just staring again, completely emotionless. After that, I started to realize why the rest of the flats remained empty. I ended up graduating with a first in my law degree, and now I help run a law firm in the city of Birmingham. I remember my time in London well, but I tried never to think about that empty apartment building ever again.
Okay, this happened today, and it really messed with me. I've been thinking about it all day and all evening. I took my five-year-old son and three-month-old daughter to the playground today to meet a friend and her daughter. It's got regular playground equipment, a huge parking lot, and a big grassy area and trees surrounding the play area. On the other side of the trees is some sort of development thing that they're working on. The area this school is in is pretty rural. It's just a bunch of twisty roads and random buildings. I've never thought about or noticed this until today. We get to the park and meet up with my friend. Another mom that we know is there with her two girls, too. The only other people there is a dad with a little girl and a boy that looked to be somewhere between 10 and 12 years old. So the moms are all sitting, chatting, playing with my adorable daughter, having a good time. The kids are playing together. Everything is good. Eventually, all the kids from our group kind of wander off through the playground, doing their own thing. The seesaws are in a shady area, and next to them is a big stretch of grass, and then the trees, with a semi-developed area behind that. My son wants to seesaw, but nobody wants to do it with him. I get up to go help him, and the 10 to 12 year old boy comes over and says, Hi, do you want me to play with them? Which was a little strange that he asked me and not my son, but I said, sure, bud, go ahead. So he gets on the other side and starts seesawing with him. His demeanor was strange. He didn't smile. His voice was completely flat. He didn't say a word to my son. He just seesawed with him. My son was oblivious and chatting away at him. After a few minutes, I started walking back to my bench, and I hear the boy start talking with my son. Okay, so maybe he's shy around grown-ups. I sit down and start talking to my friends, and the dad walks near us to probably go up to his car, and I say, Hey, it was really sweet for your son to offer to play with mine, and I smile at him. He looks at me and says, Uh, he's not my son. I don't know who he is. He walked over and asked if I wanted him to play with my daughter, and then just kind of followed us around until you guys got here. He sort of laughed, like, weird, right? And shook his head. I got a very uneasy feeling in my stomach and looked over to the seesaws. They're gone. I jump up, hand my daughter to my friend, and run in that direction, yelling my son's name. I see them walking almost to the trees, the trees are not close. I'd guess a football field or so away from the play area. I got this awful feeling and ran as fast as I could, yelling my son's name. He turned around and started trying to walk to me, and the little boy grabs his arm and tries to pull him towards the trees. My son gets upset and starts saying, Let go of me. Now usually, this is not a quality about my son that brings me anything but trouble, but he does not like to be grabbed, pushed, or pulled, and he has ADHD, so when he gets frustrated, it usually comes out in aggressive ways. I was so thankful for this today. He starts punching the boy and headbutting him like a little crazy person. The boy lets go, and as I get to them, he runs into the trees. My friends are finally realizing something is going on, so they're standing at the edge of the play area looking confused. My son is crying. I'm shaking. I don't know what just happened. I asked my son where he was going, and he said his friend wanted to take him to see Ryan. You know, from Ryan Toy Reviews. It's his favorite YouTube channel, and he talks about it non-stop. He told the boy about Ryan, and apparently the boy told him that he knew where Ryan lived, and asked if my son wanted to go visit him and play. So of course, my son said yes. I don't know what the intention was. This was a kid. I don't understand why he would lie to my son. Why he wanted him to go into the woods. Why he was acting the way he did. Maybe it was innocent. But I don't think it was. This story happened to me when I was 15 years old. 
when I was a staff member at my summer camp in upstate New York. The end of summer camp is always a large celebration. We take advantage of no campers being on property to live it up for the last night of camp. The last is always one of the joyous, melancholy, where you simultaneously have a blast, drinking with your best friends in the world, but you also know you're about to barely see any of them for another year. During this summer, we replaced a large number of buildings in one of our sub-camps, including the main camp's office building. The last night of camp, we made the biggest bonfire I have ever seen out of the rubble from the office building. The fire was spread across the turnaround point in the center of camp. You couldn't get within 25 feet of the thing without feeling like your clothes would spontaneously burst into flames. The night was fun for the first few hours. People were laughing and drinking and taking pictures, posing in front of the huge bonfire. It was one of the rare times the three subcamps got together and socialized with one another. I was hanging out with some friends from the main subcamp. I was from the smaller subcamp, towards the front end of the property, probably a little over a mile away from where we were now. I was offered my first end of summer victory cigar, which we smoked happily as we stretched out on the ground, the cool summer night making the perfect complement to the roaring blaze that burned before us. As the clocks turned to midnight, the staff from my camp was preparing to go. Calls of, to the bus, ripped through the air, and all around me, my fellow staff got up to leave. However, the guys I was hanging out with asked me to come back to a campfire with them for a while before going back to my camp. Having never really having the chance to hang out with these guys during the summer, normally, I pleaded and eventually convinced my program director to let me stay for a bit longer, and I would walk back on my own. It took a bit of convincing, but eventually, he agreed. The second campfire I went to was a lot of fun, but the only important part happened at the end. I was pulling on my sweatshirt to start my walk back, when one of my friends, we'll call him Dan, put a hand on my shoulder. Hey man, he said slowly. You sure you don't want to stay here tonight? I shook my head. It's not a long walk. I know, but... He trailed off into silence. He actually sounded kind of scared, so I turned back around. I was shocked to see worried faces staring back into mind, their features exaggerated by the light of the flames licking the air around them. I asked them what was wrong. They explained to me that strange things happen to people on the road at night. Tales of ghostly figures seen shimmering on the glass surface of the lake, strange whispering in their ears, footsteps of somebody who was walking directly behind them, but would stop whenever they stopped and turned around. As they told me these tales, I felt a chill run down my spine and an increasingly large part of me suddenly wanted to stay there and go back to my camp in the morning. Then it hit me. I was first year staff. It was commonplace for older staff to pull pranks on the younger first years, and scaring the wits out of me like I was a scared little boy was one of those pranks. I see what you're doing, I said, smiling, the feelings of fear draining out of my body as quickly as they had come. But you're not going to scare me that easy. They protested, insisted they weren't joking. I was impressed at the levels they were willing to go to trick me, but at that point, I wasn't going to be convinced to stay. I really wish I had listened to them. The camp road was a thin stretch of a groomed gray gravel path. The silvery gray of the road almost seemed to glow in the moonlight in contrast to the darkness of the gnarled forest on either side. To my left, the forest rose up into one of those mountains that surrounded our camp, and to the right, it dropped off a slight cliff into a copse of thick woods and swamp. The walk started off simple enough. I passed the sign to the archery range on my left, the first sign I was leaving the main camp area. 
Next came the camp turnaround, where the fire had been. There were still a few stragglers by the now mostly smoking mountain of wood, making sure all traces of it went out before they went to bed. I waved at them as I passed, but I'm not even sure if they saw me. I didn't use a flashlight when I walked around camp normally. I preferred to let my eyes adjust to the darkness. I walked past the turnaround, the road bent to my left, and the last vestiges of light were lost behind me to the endless inky black of the woods. Pretty much, as soon as I left the office fire behind, things started to get strange. Try as I might, I couldn't get out of my head the stories my friends told me about the camp road at night. The one that was particularly getting to me was the silent stalker, the spirit who would match your footsteps exactly. If you walked, he walked. If you stopped, he would stop. If you turned around to face him, he would be behind you in the opposite direction. And if you ran, he would chase you. As I thought about this silent stalker, I could hear a second pair of footsteps behind me. They were close. So close to me they could be breathing down my neck. My body tensed, and I fought to keep my growing fear down. The night was oddly silent. The normal creatures of the night had apparently vanished, replacing the sounds of the woods with an eerie silence. I picked up my pace, and my follower picked up the pace behind me. Somehow, as close as the footsteps had seemed before, they were even closer now. Any second I would be snatched and pulled into the forest by some unspeakable horror. Or, despite myself, I whirled around. There was nobody there. Just the creepy, pearly glow of the road stretched out before me. Very funny, Dan, I called out, my voice echoing off the mountain to my right. Very funny, echoes off the mountain. That's all those second footsteps are, just echoes off the mountain. Even though I knew it was a lie, it made me feel marginally better. All the same, I decided the silent stalker would have to jog to keep up with me. As I jogged, the lake side of the road came up on my right. This made me feel slightly better, as the openness of the lake provided a good deal more light from the moon. It also meant I was more than halfway back to my camp, so close to my bed and my friends, and away from this creepy dark road. I continued to hear my stalker behind me. I was doing my best to ignore him. But then, something changed. The footsteps behind me vanished, and instead... I hear the crunch of dead leaves to the woods on my left. Refusing to turn towards the sound, I kept my jog as heavy footfalls in the woods to my left continued to pace with me. It was an animal. It was an echo. It was somebody trying to scare me. Every excuse in the book that prevented me from facing the truth was whirling around my mind at once. Screw jogging. I started to sprint. The thing in the woods kept pace with me, running and running. I could not outrun it. It was going to get me, whatever it was. As I sprinted, despite my mind screaming to the contrary, I whipped the flashlight out from my pocket and pointed it towards the woods on my left. There, larger than life, was a man. He was clad in a red and black flannel and blue jeans. His torso was faced completely towards me, as his huge arms swung from side to side like large pendulums as he ran alongside me. His face was wrong. It was splotchy like it was melting. There were no discernible features, no eyes or nose or lips or anything. But the second I looked into his face, my blood turned to ice. My limbs suddenly failed me and turned to jelly. My knees buckled and I collapsed onto the road, flashlight spinning out of my hand, skidding across the road in front of me. I groaned in pain. I rolled over and felt warm blood from my knees and legs in my hands. Slowly, 
I staggered back to my feet, wincing with the pain in my knees. It was at this moment I felt a slight breeze. The next second, I realized I could hear the forest again. The chirping of crickets, the croaking of frogs, the hooting of owls. I didn't even realize how quiet the woods had been without these sounds. I scooped up my fallen flashlight and shone it into the woods. The man had vanished. I asked my friends from the campfire the night before if they had played a trick on me. They swore up and down that they did not, and still swear it to this day. I have discovered many secrets of my camp in the years I was staffed there, but I don't think I will ever know what exactly happened in the woods that night. Since almost a year now, end of August 2019 to be exact, I have moved to an apartment in a different city because my mother who I lived with in my hometown passed away from cancer. I have moved here with my long-term boyfriend and one other roommate who has been a good friend of both of us since before we had even started dating. We all absolutely love it here. The location is great. It's a 15-minute bike ride from my university and it's located at a square with a grocery store, drug store, lunch rooms, etc. So we pretty much have everything we could possibly need to survive within walking distance. However, after just a month or two of living here, someone has started to ring my doorbell at exactly 11.05 p.m. semi-regularly, sometimes every day, sometimes every other day. Sometimes there's a week in between, and sometimes there are a couple of weeks in between, but it is always at 11.05 p.m. And every single time, I get no answer each time I ask through the intercom who it is. Except for one time, but I will get to that in a bit. At first, I thought it were friends from one of the neighbors who accidentally rang the wrong doorbell, but after around the fourth time, I grew suspicious. And after more than those four times, I started noticing that it always happens at either exactly 11.05 p.m. or a few minutes earlier or later. My boyfriend and roommate both work at bars, and so they work until very late and would usually only get home around 2 a.m. So each time it happened, I was always alone at home, and it started to really freak me out after a while. When I first told them about it, they kind of shrugged it off and said that it was probably a wrong dial, like I thought at first. But when I told them that it has happened so many times, and sometimes even daily, they didn't really believe me and thought that I was just a little paranoid and spooked. However, one night, when the doorbell rang again and I answered the intercom asking who it was, I heard very heavy breathing. I was thoroughly spooked at that moment. I was again home alone and kept asking who they were and what they wanted. I couldn't tell from the breathing if it was a man or a woman, but I heard a strange mumbling or whispering, and then it was dead silent, and they had appeared to have left. I had put my apartment door on a double lock after that. I was so scared and spooked. Thankfully, my roommate got home a little earlier that night, around 30 minutes after the doorbell rang, and he could tell how upset I was. Now, with the virus, my roommate and boyfriend aren't able to work anymore, and they now also witnessed the frequent door ringing at 11.05 p.m., so they now do believe me and agree that it is very odd and creepy. We have a balcony that looks down at where our apartment building's main front door is, but because there's also a shop right underneath us that always has those curtain roof things out, the view to the door is partially obscured. Every time our doorbell rang, me, my boyfriend, and roommate would go to the balcony to see if we could see anyone, but we never could. I have also asked my neighbors from my apartment building if their doorbell also gets rang so often, but the ones that I asked all said that it has never happened to them. So two weeks ago, my roommate decided to do some investigating 
and went outside our apartment building at 11 p.m., standing across the street and pretended to have a smoke while keeping an eye on the door. He said he did see a man who looked kind of suspicious wandering around our apartment building who slowed down his pace significantly as soon as he approached our door. But when he spotted my roommate looking at him, he quickly walked away. We aren't 100% sure if that's the door ringer, but that was very suspicious. Our doorbell hasn't been rang at night since that day, and I am hoping that maybe it will stop now. But there is a possibility that it will continue again in a few weeks. Although, I really hope not. Who knows what this person's intentions really are. This happened a long time ago, when I was younger, and I have a really bad memory. This is just me recounting the memory to the best of my ability and what I was told. I also want to preface the story that this story takes place somewhere in Indonesia where it's most commonplace to have maids in your household. When I was younger, I had a strong relationship with my extended family. To me, it was normal to be close with your extended family. And when I mean extended, I don't even know how they're related to me. In particular, I was close with my grand-aunt's family, calling her grand-aunt Sheila, whose daughters were like my big sisters. Being the eldest child, I liked being babied by them since I was always expected to be the big sister for my little brother. This is important for later. I was maybe 11 years old or younger, Neither my parents or I could remember when it exactly happened. I just want to say, as a kid, I loved milk. I still do, though I tend to stick with skim milk now. When I was younger, I had a favorite local brand that had the usual strawberry flavor. The brand was called Ultra Milk. It was always cool that I was drinking something pink. Unbeknownst to my parents, a gift basket had showed up to our doorsteps, and the maids had taken the gift, thinking it was a present from one of my mother's friends. My parents had even seen the gift basket and didn't think much of it. It was full of fruit, sweets, etc. The usual kind you would send to someone maybe on a special occasion. It should have been weird that there wasn't a special occasion, but another weird part was that usually Gift baskets had a card or something to indicate where it had come from, but there was no indication from who it came from. But the maids had overlooked it, and my parents didn't notice at the time. They had assumed the head maid had checked it through. She didn't. In the gift basket, there was my favorite tiny carton of my favorite milk, even strawberry flavored. I had lessons with a tutor, and oftentimes, the maid accompanying me to the lesson would bring me snacks or food, since the tutoring would take a few hours. I was at my tutor's house, and she was teaching me about the homework that I had gotten today. When I got thirsty, and I got my carton of milk to take a sip out, I was ready to take a sip of the extremely sweet, artificially flavored strawberry, milky goodness. But something was wrong. It didn't taste right. I don't remember what it did taste like, but I knew that it was wrong. I remember describing to my parents that it felt like I licked the bottom of a foot of a metal framed chair I had in my room at my desk. It just tasted awful. It tasted like metal. Thinking that maybe it was spoiled, I immediately, without swallowing, grabbed some tissues off the table and spat out the mouthful into the tissue and was surprised to see sort of weird metallic beads in it. Like metal, but it was liquid. I have never seen anything like it, and I was confused. My tutor was even more confused and horrified that I had just spat out a strange metallic substance. I didn't really understand what was going on, but my tutor asked to take the carton of milk where I had tried to drink from and told me to just continue working while she went to investigate. Apparently, my tutor and her head maid went outside and poured a bit more of the milk into a tissue and there was more of this weird metallic liquid in there. 
She asked me if I had drank any of it, and I told her that maybe I took a sip and swallowed before I realized that something was wrong with it. After that, my tutor apparently called my mom and told her that I had been possibly poisoned. I went home without finishing my lesson, becoming slightly concerned that maybe something was wrong. I went home, and I don't really remember what happened after that. There wasn't a poison center in my country, and no emergency services that would really respond, so my parents took me to a doctor to have blood tests done. I remember being pulled out of school. My mom wanted me to stay home from school for the next few days, which was great to me. No one told me the severity of the situation, and my mom just told me that she wanted me to chill at home for a while. No school? I get to have fun? No way. So I did. I stayed home and watched Avatar The Last Airbender on DVD, while my parents were fretting over the idea that I might have been poisoned by mercury. The gift basket, which had already been taken apart and stored to eat for later, it was all reassembled, and my parents tried to go with this to the police. But they really couldn't do anything, since we literally had no leads on where this gift basket came from, since it had no card, and the police really couldn't care less about our situation. Again, third world country. I don't really know what happened, other than I was pretty cool with staying home and playing. My life at home wasn't perfect, but they were really nice to me during this time, so I enjoyed it a lot, since I didn't really understand. I think my parents kept a lot of things from me to keep me from getting scared. My parents even took me overseas, to Singapore, even taking the liquid found in the carton with them in a tin, or whatever, to show the doctors there, where I got tested some more and didn't seem to have any signs of poisoning. I didn't swallow enough of it. I'm not sure if it really was mercury. No one has ever told me, but at the end of the day, Everyone was glad that I didn't drink enough of it to get affected by whatever it was. Now, to get into the suspect part. My parents later told me that they had a sneaking suspicion that it was possibly that my grandaunt Sheila was the one who tried to poison me. I didn't know this at the time, but around the time of this incident, grandaunt Sheila was found to have stolen gold and jewelry from my parents' store for years worth thousands. My parents were furious, wanted to report her to the authorities, and my grandma, her sister, loved her too much and instead just cut contact with her. Since then, Grand Aunt Sheila had seemed to want to enact vengeance over being caught and has been trying to get back at us. My mom had warned me that I couldn't play with the big sisters, Grand Aunt Sheila's daughters, anymore since they did something very bad and to never get into a car with them if they showed up at my school. But it didn't click in my mind until now. Thinking back, Grand Aunt Sheila was close enough to me to know that I loved drinking milk and maybe tried to hurt my family, even if it meant hurting her grandniece or whatever I am to her. We could never confirm that it was her but my grandaunt Sheila has continued to be a thorn in my family's side for years, though my parents have learned a lesson and ensured that whenever we received a gift basket, there had to be a name on it. My grandmother doesn't believe her sister did this, but my parents firmly believe that she was the one responsible. But we have no proof other than her horrible character. We have received weird gifts like black seeds and hair that was supposedly some sort of witchcraft thing. We assumed that this was all from Grand Aunt Sheila, who still lived in the same city as us. It only made sense. My parents never bought me the Ultra Milk brand again, which I was okay with, since that moment spoiled the Ultra Milk brand to me. I was reminded of this story while drinking strawberry milk the other day, a different brand. I am no longer living in Indonesia, not in the same country as Grand Aunt Sheila. Even so, to Grand Aunt Sheila, or whoever was the one who tried to spike a carton of strawberry milk to poison an 11-year-old girl, I hope I never see you again, and you better hope I don't too.
So this happened about five years ago while I was nine months pregnant. I was Christmas shopping at the mall with my then seven and 15 year old daughters one Saturday night in a very safe city with low crime rate. There was an Applebee's connected to the mall and we ended our shopping pretty late and the mall stores were starting to close. So I took my kids to the connected Applebee's for a late dinner. We finish up eating at about 10 p.m and leave out the Applebee's entrance into the practically deserted parking lot with shopping bags in tow. As we got to the car, I was in the middle of maneuvering the shopping bags on my arms to find my keys when a 50-ish year old crusty looking guy starts walking up from somewhere in the parking lot with shaggy gray hair and a faded flannel shirt and old jeans. I noticed him briskly approaching when he was about 40 feet away and he said, This is a stick up. Give me all your money. My blood ran cold, and I stared at him owlishly and shakingly said, What? He then said he was just kidding and came up and stood right next to my daughters, who were standing on the other side of the car, waiting for me to unlock the car to let them in. He then starts making small talk with my daughters. He's asking things like if they were being good girls for Santa, how old they were, if we got all of our Christmas shopping done, and what kind of things did we get, etc. He didn't seem drunk, high, slow, or mentally challenged at all. He was very coherent and seemed of sound mind. Mind you, I was a heavily pregnant woman alone with my two daughters in a mostly deserted parking lot at 10 o'clock at night, who was being approached by a stranger who came and stood right next to my kids on the other side of the car, just shooting the breeze, talking to me and my kids with his hands in his pockets and occasionally looking over his shoulder. I didn't want to aggravate him, so I was politely conversing with him and trying to look calm and nonchalant while trying to disguise my frantic hands, digging inside my giant purse for my car keys. This exchange went on for a couple minutes while he periodically kept looking over his shoulder. I was silently panicking and trying to politely keep the situation from escalating by calmly and nonchalantly talking to him while also trying in vain to find my damned car keys to get us out of there. They were hiding good in my purse. I felt that at any moment, he was going to pull a knife, and my kids were right next to him, away from their mother, on the other side of the car, and I couldn't find my car keys to get my kids into the safety of the car. He kept trying to engage them in conversation, and I could see that my oldest daughter was a little weirded out, and she kept glancing at me to gauge my assessment and reaction to the situation. Kids often tend to not recognize potential danger when they are with their parents, since they see us as their protectors. And being that he was only talking and acting friendly, and I was doing my best to stay calm, they were oblivious to the alarming situation that we were in. And being nine months pregnant, I was no match for this full-grown man, especially if he was hiding a weapon on him. While still desperately digging for my keys, I tried to politely give him hints that the conversation was over by saying things like, Well, it was nice chatting with you, but I gotta get these kids to bed. And, It was nice meeting you. And telling my girls to say that it was nice meeting him too. My polite attempt to get this guy to leave wasn't working, because he kept sidestepping my attempts and asking them what their favorite school subjects are and how nice young ladies they were, etc., while I was struggling with the shopping bags and digging in my giant cluttered purse for my car keys. My outgoing seven-year-old was completely oblivious to how not okay this situation was because he was being friendly and because of the whole I'm with mommy, so I'm safe child mentality. So she started to talk about what she picked out for daddy for Christmas and started enthusiastically talking about kid stuff and asking him if he knew what Minecraft was, etc., and keeping this creep from leaving us alone by keeping him engaged in conversation. They didn't realize that I was becoming desperate. Then, 
I suddenly felt this sinking feeling of dread when I realized that I may have lost my keys in the mall and that we were stuck outside with this strange man who kept looking over his shoulders and was showing no signs of walking away. And I was thinking that he was waiting for the perfect moment to pounce. All he had to do was grab one of my girls and threaten their life, knowing it would make me do whatever he wanted as long as he wouldn't hurt them. I started to feel my adrenaline start to spike and my heart and stomach started doing flip-flops and I felt like at any moment everything was going to go down as the gravity of realizing that there were no other people or witnesses around and that we were totally alone with him and at that moment the odds were stacked against us and that he had his chance. Then he all of a sudden said, Okay, it was nice talking with you. See you later. And walked off in the same direction as to which he came. It wasn't until then I found my car keys and unlocked the car and told my kids to get in fast. And I got in too and locked the doors. I started the car and drove out of there. My 15-year-old lightheartedly and jokingly said, Okay, that was weird. And laughed. I was overwhelmed with relief, and then I was confused over what just happened. I thought to myself, why would a guy of seemingly sound mind think it totally acceptable to go out of his way just to approach a woman and her kids in a deserted parking lot late at night, just to chit-chat, but being that nothing bad happened, I brushed it off and joked about it too. When we got home, my husband greeted us and asked us how shopping went, and I said that it went well, and my 15-year-old told him what happened in the parking lot and how weird it was, and was kind of joking about it. I started joking too, saying how I was mentally having a panic attack while trying to look calm, and I started making fun of myself by telling my husband how I was attempting to inconspicuously rummage through my purse to find my car keys. My husband went completely white and I acknowledged his horrified look of alarm, and I assured him that albeit creepy, this guy was just talking and eventually left on his own. Now, my father-in-law is a retired sheriff deputy, and my husband went through police academy training after graduating high school, and being that the knowledge he gained from that, plus growing up with a cop for a dad, I found out why my husband looked absolutely horrified when I told him the details. What my husband told me completely rattled me to the bone. My husband told me that he was 100% sure that the reason why the guy was hanging around us and chit-chatting was because he was waiting for me to unlock my car and the reason why he was standing next to our kids was because once I unlocked the car and the kids started to get inside, he was most likely going to force himself into the car with the kids to gain leverage on me, to force me to cooperate knowing that I would not abandon my kids, which would force me to get into the car with them and do whatever he wanted me to do, which most likely would be to drive to a remote location to do God knows what, and being that he wasn't wearing a mask suggests that his intentions were to also leave no witnesses to identify him. I then remembered that he was positioned by the backseat passenger door where my seven-year-old was standing by waiting to get in. My husband then told me that the most likely reason why the guy ended up leaving was because it took so long for me to find my keys and the longer it took, the more anxious and spooked it made him. And that whole time, I was desperate to find my car keys, which through some sort of divine intervention stayed hidden in my purse thus saving us from potentially being abducted and killed. So I work at a grocery company that is slowly making its many name brand stores across the country. This story takes place last year, a few months after my 16th birthday. I decided to get a job because I was tired of doing nothing all day in my house, and I figured, why not earn some money? At this point in time, 
All I worked was the night shift, which was normally 3 p.m. to 10 p.m. almost every day. I wasn't a cashier when this took place. I was a UT, which is basically a buggy boy. Obviously, I took in the buggies all day, but I also cleaned the bathrooms every hour and took out all of the trash every night. I also stayed an hour late to help the stalkers finish up their work so we could all get out at the same time. One night, I was working, and it was nearing towards the end of my shift. I was gathering up my last bit of grocery carts as the store was closing down. As I made a trip outside to get the carts, I noticed a man dressed in all black standing at the end of the shopping center. I was a little concerned, but didn't think much of it. As I headed back inside though, I noticed the man got closer. I could see his face, and he had no expression. I walked inside and told my manager to come outside with me so she could stand at the door while I got the remaining buggies outside. Me and my manager were very close, so she had no problem with it. As I walked outside, I could see the man out of the corner of my eye. As I began to head towards the buggies, the man started walking very fast towards me with the most horrible smile on his face. He kept getting closer and closer until he saw my manager. The second he saw her, the man instantly turned around and disappeared around the store corner. I was in shock at what just happened. I don't know what this man's intentions were, but I'm glad I got my manager to come outside with me. Unfortunately, this is not where the story ends. After all my buggies were in, I noticed a little black carry basket. The company doesn't allow customers to take them outside, but someone must have took one out there. So my manager said that I had to go get it, but the guy was probably still roaming around. So I got in my car and went to go and get it, and then drive back to the store. Now it's not like the basket was super close to the store, because I would have just went out and grabbed it, but it was all the way across the parking lot. So I got the basket and gave it to my manager and went to leave. But my teenage self thought it would be a good idea to park my car in the parking lot and call one of my friends to tell her what had just happened, instead of driving home, which was in a whole other city about 20 minutes away. So I call my friend to say what happened, and I notice a figure getting close to my car. I immediately recognized it to be the man coming straight to my car with an object in his hand. I hit the gas and drove out of that parking lot so fast. Nothing else happened after that. Soon I transferred to the same store, but in the town that I lived in, and I don't really do the night shifts anymore. Not by choice, but it's because once you've worked there long enough, you start to have more day shifts. I have no idea what that man's intentions were, and I have no idea what he was holding in his hand. I'm not sure. I want to know. The police just left my home. A couple of months ago, while house-sitting or dog-sitting for my parents, I had an eerie feeling. As an obsessive ID channel watcher and younger female, I played it off as paranoia. During these few days, whenever I took the dog out, he suddenly began sniffing areas that he never sniffed before, particularly under each of our windows. And thankfully, it's because of him that I discovered two larger footprints under a window that looks directly into our living room. Around this same time, about two months ago, I noticed a man walking up and down our street that I had never seen in the entirety of my life. He also had, in my opinion, odd mannerisms, prolonged eye contact, continued staring and craning his neck as he walked by and never returned my smiles, hellos, or waves. Eventually I became irritated due to how creeped out I was with both him and the eerie feeling in general and decided to wave upon no acknowledgement in return. 
other than a cold stare. I got up and acted like I was going to follow him down the street, to which made him walk faster and turn a sudden corner. I never saw him again. Now, today, I help my parents out by picking up their dog from the groomers, as it's right up the street and a safe suburban area. Oftentimes I don't lock while running errands in town. When I returned home with the dog, I had an unexplained, horrible feeling the minute I walked in the door. Something, maybe a blanket, seemed misplaced. Something was off. I threw a load of laundry on in the basement and quickly stood up and looked around. No one there. Then I proceeded to the bathroom to check my makeup, and right then, I looked down to my left, and there's feces in the toilet, with no toilet paper and not flushed. I've been the only one home all morning. I immediately threw back the shower curtain and started shaking, and when nothing was there, I closed the bathroom door and locked myself inside. I called dispatch, and they arrived in less than five minutes, searched the entire property, make me check my laptop to see if any recent search history isn't my own, and check the fridge to see if food is missing. All valuables are accounted for. I know this isn't my feces, and no one in my family would use the toilet and not flush. I know someone has been here, yet because I love horror movies and the ID channel, no one believes me.